Welcome back, everyone. Today we continue with part 52 of our What If Goku Was Betrayed and Locked Inside the Hyperbolic Time Chamber series. Let's aim for 300 likes on this one, okay? Also, don't forget to leave a comment. Let me know if you've enjoyed the series so far. With that, let's begin. The sight caught Akumu off guard. His face mirrored his shock. Such a scenario was beyond anyone's expectations. It was as though everything had been arranged just for this moment creating the perfect conditions for what was to come. And there it was, amidst the chaos of swirling energy, the second portion of the aqua foam. It danced around Goku, a spectacular display of power and beauty. It was then that Amuku had a thought that puzzled him deeply. Is this what the Omni King really wants? Could it be possible to draw it out from him? Initially, the Omni King had made it clear that for the aqua foam to fully manifest, both Goku and Vegeta, who each harbored separate half of the same aqua foam within, would need to become one merge it into its pure original form. Yet, now this strategy was as good as gone with the wind. For some unknown reason each half of the aqua foam are rejecting to merge with each other. Zeno's theory was that this was due to the Sane's change in nature. This was due to the path the Sane have chosen to follow. One chose destruction and the other chose neutrality. The aqua foam must have bonded with them in a way that made fusing impossible due to its constant rejection. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Amuku reached out to the Omni King telepathically, a connection spanning across dimensions, right from the depths of the Saiyan's psyche. He relayed his discovery to Zeno with a sense of urgency. Zeno-sama, ever so composed, couldn't help but feel a wave of disappointment wash over him. Yet another unforeseen obstacle had emerged, thwarting his plans. It had escaped his calculations that the Saiyans would unlock the full potential of the Aqua Foam. Moreover, their bond with the Aqua Foam, a connection that could only stem from the purest of hearts, was something he hadn't anticipated. Nevertheless, the purity of heart was of little concern to the Omni King. His eyes were set on a single prize, the Aqua Foam, the key to unlocking the fountain that led to the Eternal Realm, the dwelling of his parents. My plans have to be revised again the Omni King muttered in frustration. Turning to Amuku, he inquired, When you ventured into his psyche, you observed the aqua foam dispersing around him, correct? Yes, my lord, Amuku responded, his voice laced with curiosity. It behaved unusually, not adhering to the patterns we recognize as divine aura. That's because it isn't supposed to, Zeno explained with a hint of impatience. The term divine aura is merely a label for a subset of angelic and destructive energies. The aqua foam, however, is derived from the essence of my father. It is his tears, that liquid fell from his eyes when I was conceived. He had tears only once, that is why that substance is the only thing capable of unveiling the path to the eternal realm. Pausing for a moment, the Omni King shared a truth known to very few. Amuku, heed my words carefully. Despite appearances, I am not the true king of everything. That title belongs to my father. I am merely a king in training, a placeholder until I am destined to ascend to his position. This illusion of rule is part of my trial, a period during which my father remains hands off. My foresight is unmatched, my predictions unerring. Yet, my singular flaw lies in my inability to foresee beyond the moment someone defies those very predictions. This is my weakness and my greatest shame. The Omni King confided with a rare hint of vulnerability. Let me be clear, I am an omnipotent being, one possessing power beyond compare, even surpassing that of my father who is the current true king of everything. Yet, where he embodies the ultimate wisdom, I find myself lacking. He is the epitome of knowledge, an omniscient being, and it is in this aspect that my trial lies. I must eclipse my father's intellect and aspire to omniscience myself. Only by becoming both all-knowing and all-powerful can I truly inherit the mantle of the true king of everything from my father. This revelation left Amuku, the Daishiken, and all the angelic priests reeling. Such profound insight was overwhelming, particularly for the grand priest, who had not anticipated any of this. He realized, with a jolt of clarity, how little he truly understood. Barely a year ago, he had only just learned of Zeno's parents, followed by the ambitious goal to breach the Eternal Realm. Now, this staggering disclosure reshaped his entire understanding of his existence. The Grand Priest had always believed his purpose was to serve the Omni King, to cater to his whims and desires. Yet, the knowledge he had just been imparted with illuminated his true purpose. He was not merely created to serve. His existence was intrinsically tied to aiding Zeno in overcoming his trial. His real purpose was to facilitate the transformation of Zeno into the true king of everything. With this newfound understanding, the Grand Priest recognized that nothing else could compare in importance, not his children, not the multiverse as it could be recreated anew, 
not even his own existence, for he could be replaced if necessary. Nothing was to stand in the way of Zeno's ascension beyond his father's legacy. Amuku, Zeno said with a commanding tone, show me what you have seen. Of course, my lord, I would love to, but the distance is too far. Amuku replied, his voice tinged with regret. Telepathic communication is one thing, but projecting my thoughts outside your pocket dimension is too much for my current abilities. Zeno rose from his throne, his expression determined. Then I'll join you, he declared. My lord, you mustn't, the grand priest interjected, his voice filled with concern. Shouldn't we serve you instead? How about sending me? No, Zeno replied firmly. I realize now that I've been going about this all wrong. This is a trial for me, and all this time, I've been commanding you and my other subjects to do everything in my stead. It's time I, the future king of everything, get my hands dirty. The Grand Priest, visibly shocked by this unexpected change in the Omni King, nodded slowly. Okay then, allow me to join you. Zeno nodded in agreement, then turned back to Amuku. Amuku, he called out. Is this the same chase for Vegeta as well? I'm unsure my lord, Amuku confessed, his tone earnest. This was so intriguing that I decided to contact you immediately. I apologize for my negligence. I should have confirmed this right away. Okay, Zeno replied. Both the Grand Priest and I will be there in one minute. In the meantime, confirm if it is the same for Vegeta. With that, the telecommunication ended. At Zeno's command, the Grand Priest swiftly opened a portal linking Zeno's palace to Amuku's exact location. Without hesitation, they stepped through. Amuku, who had been projecting his consciousness into Goku's psyche, returned to his own body. Without wasting another moment, he placed his finger on Vegeta's forehead, attempting to do the same. However, he soon found that entering Vegeta's psyche proved much more of a challenge. Amuku chuckled lightly as he sensed the formidable mental barrier in front of him. Well, this is interesting. This sane, even in this state, manages to maintain his mental fortitude. His laughter echoed slightly, amused by the challenge before him. Okay then, sane. I admit, your mental strength far surpasses that sane over there, but when it comes to me, you're out of your league, boy. With a surge of his energy, or ki, Amuku pushed harder, finally breaking through Vegeta's mental defenses. He had successfully projected his consciousness into the mind of Vegeta. However, the landscape of Vegeta's mind was starkly different from Goku's. It was harsh and vivid, reflecting a warrior who trained relentlessly, even within his own psyche. In contrast, Goku's inner world was calm and relaxing dominated by thoughts of sleep and food. Fascinating, murmured Amuku as he navigated this new, rugged mental terrain. He began searching for the ultra-instinct aura he had detected in Goku, but it was absent in Vegeta. Instead, he stumbled upon a different divine aura, one that seemed familiar yet distinctly more refined and pure than what he had felt years ago. Is this truly destruction energy? Amuku exclaimed his voice a mix of excitement and disbelief. This aura was nothing like those wielded by the so-called weak gods of destruction. The only one of those fools who had decent potential was that Beerus fellow, and that Arak fellow too, his aura felt weird. But this boy, his aura, it outclasses them by a landslide. It's as if he has not only mastered it but perfected it beyond perfection. Amuku was in shock. He had never imagined that destruction energy could reach such an advanced state. Driven by his newfound curiosity, Amuku followed the aura trail, just as he had with Goku. It led him directly to Vegeta's exact location. And just like with Goku, the aquafoam had dispersed from within Vegeta, now fully enveloping him like the very air he breathed. There it is, Amuku murmured with a hint of triumph. The second half of the aquafoam. Zeno will be pleased to hear this. I better be there to greet him. Just then, Amuku sensed the precise moment when both the Grand Priest and Zeno entered his domain. His exceptional spatial awareness alerted him to their arrival. Interestingly, even though Amuku's mind was elsewhere, projected into Vegeta's psyche, his body was far from defenseless. This was due to his mastery of the Ultra Instinct technique, which allowed his body to act and react independently, without the need for conscious thought. Given that Amuku himself had developed Ultra Instinct, it was fascinating to consider the extent of his proficiency with it. After confirming that both Saiyans were experiencing similar phenomena, Amuku decided it was time to return to his own body, ready to welcome Zeno once more. The scene then shifted, taking us back in time. We find ourselves at a critical moment when Moro, the notorious planet eater, steps aboard his ship, prepared to launch a fateful journey toward planet Vegeta. After sensing a massive energy spike on planet Vegeta, Moro became curious about the cause of this disturbance. Months had passed back on planet Vegeta, and during that time, 
Broly and Yamoshi had defeated a formidable evil Sane and restored peace to their world. In honor of their valor, King Salada, the ruler of the time, proclaimed them heroes and erected statues to commemorate their victories, one for Broly as the legendary Super Sign, and another for Yamoshi as the first Super Sign god. In the training hall, the air was charged with intense energy as Broly trained under Yamoshi's watchful eye. Although Broly's power was immense, Yamoshi's skill and technique far surpassed him. In every sparring match in their base forms, Yamoshi would emerge victorious, showcasing his superior combat skills. Broly, bursting with raw ki, was already incredibly powerful. However, Yamoshi believed that to enhance Broly's abilities further, it was crucial to teach him the proper techniques that embodied the true fighting essence of the Saiyan race. By mastering these skills, Broly could potentially unlock even greater levels of his transformational power. Their shared goal was ambitious, to reach the final transformation available to a Saiyan without the intervention of God Ki, known as the legendary Super Saiyan 6. This ultimate form represented the pinnacle of Saiyan potential. A few days had passed, and on the serene training grounds of Planet Vegeta, a regular sparring session under the watchful eye of Yamoshi was abruptly disrupted. The skies darkened, and a cold silence enveloped the area as an ominous spaceship ship pierced the atmosphere, its descent marking the arrival of an unwelcome guest. Yamoshi, his eyes wide with a mixture of shock and resolve, recognized the distinctive markings on the hull. It's Moro, the planet eater. He has finally come. He muttered under his breath, his voice carrying a weight of destiny and dread. Moro's reputation preceded him. Tales of his previous visits were the stuff of nightmares, stories told to sane warriors as warnings of ultimate defeat. Each time Moro visited, he left the planet weaker, its defenders humiliated and drained of their strength. His ability to drain life energy was unparalleled, making him a feared name across the galaxies. As Moro's ship landed, the atmosphere among the Saiyans was one of palpable fear mixed with a forced respect for the power the warlock wielded. The Saiyans, known for their pride and fighting spirit, lined up in two straight rows, creating a pathway from the ship to the palace. Their expressions were grim, each warrior internally battling the instinct to fight against the submission to a force greater than themselves. King Salada, current ruler of Planet Vegeta, hurriedly mobilized his elite guards and strategists, preparing the defenses of his palace. However, as he faced his people, his mask of confidence barely concealed the dread within. This was not a battle they had prepared for, not like this. Moro stepped out of his ship, flanked by his menacing crew, each step measured, his eyes scanning the assembly of warriors before him. The Saiyans watched in silent defiance and fear as Moro walked down the makeshift aisle, his presence demanding submission. Reaching the end of the rose, Moro stood before King Salada. The air was thick with tension as the king greeted him, his voice lacking its usual command. Welcome Lord Moro. To what do we owe the honor of your visit? Moro's laugh was low and chilling. Do I need a reason to visit a planet that has entertained me so well in the past? His gaze was piercing, and his voice held a hint of amusement mixed with a threatening undertone. But since you ask, I sensed a surge of power on your little world. I came to see this disturbance for myself. You know I cannot resist adding more strength to my own. The Saiyans shifted uneasily, their hands itching for the hilts of their weapons, yet knowing full well the futility of resistance. The king bowed slightly, his voice a whisper of surrender. Of course, my lord. Moro's gaze then turned cold and commanding. Then tell me, King Salada, where is this power that beckoned me from across the stars? Surely you would not dare conceal such a prize from me. King Salada's face drained of color, the pressure of the moment weighing heavily upon him. With nowhere to turn and his warrior's eyes upon him, he stuttered. I, I am not sure what you sense Lord Moro. We have no such power here. Moro's expression darkened, his patience wearing thin. Do not insult my intelligence, Salada. Your planet has sparked my interest not once but several times. Now, tell me where it hides, or I shall take what I want by force. As the tension reached its peak, King Salada was painfully aware of the hopelessness of their situation. With a heavy heart, he began to kneel, submitting to Moro's will in an effort to spare his people from the warlock's wrath. The sight of their king humiliated spurred whispers of dissent among the Saiyans, but fear of Moro's power held them back. It was at this moment, with King Salada kneeling before Moro, that Yamoshi could no longer contain himself. Striding forward, his aura began to crackle with energy, drawing the eyes of every Saiyan, and Moro's keen interest. Enough Moro, our king will not bow to you today, nor any day. Yamoshi declared, his voice thundering across the field. That's it for this episode guys, if you've watched to the end then that may be an indication that you enjoy the episode, so please drop a like so the video could reach more people. See you in the next episode.